Do you still remember? It was just over a little, a year ago, on 21st of August, 2017. It was global news. Do you remember what happened on 21st of August, 2017? In some ways, it was not quite like any other day, night in the middle of the day. We call it total solar eclipse. Solar eclipses are spectacular events of nature. And the one on that day last year was visible, as you may now recall in North America, across the large part of the United States, as the shadow of the moon moved. Hence, many people could firsthand witness the interplay between light and darkness. You probably know how it all begins as well. It starts with a partial eclipse of the moon as it increasingly eats into the yellow and bright body of the sun. The light begins to dramatically decrease. The temperature falls as much as by 10 degrees of Celsius, and the air begins to move. And the main path of the moon's shadow as the sun becomes completely covered, the darkness suddenly embraces you. You can see the stars, the planets, the sun's corona, the bright ring around the dark middle. And those who experienced, uh, apparently, the solar eclipse mention how exciting the experience was. And they said how even spiritual the experience was. It creates feelings of excitement, they say, and anxiety at the same time. Even the animals respond with sounds of disquiet to the sudden change of light into darkness. Plants begin to close their flowers. Birds get silent. Animals lay down. And people shout and cry in amazement or joy. Everything is covered in darkness, silence, and even some sort of strangeness. Our text in Luke says, Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness all over the earth until the ninth hour. Who of all the many people who experienced the astonishment of total solar eclipse remembered that darkness has also covered the world when Jesus was dying on the cross. I think even we Christians do not readily think about the darkness surrounding Jesus on the cross when we look at the images of solar eclipse. Generally speaking, when we mention the cross, we don't readily consider the fact that Jesus was dying in darkness. Translated into our own time, the darkness came at 12 midday when the sun was the brightest and lasted for three hours till 3 p.m. in the afternoon. It was certainly not the usual astronomical or natural darkness caused by a solar eclipse. Technically, a solar eclipse on that Friday when Jesus was dying was not even possible because the festival of Passover fell when there was full moon. You can't have a full moon and at the same time moon eclipsing the sun, right? Just not possible. Moreover, no solar eclipse lasts for three hours at its peak when you have darkness. When the darkness is the strongest, it lasts a few seconds or up to maybe seven minutes, no more than that. Um, no, it was not a darkness caused by the moon covering the sun. Neither it was caused by fine dust from the desert, as some commentators today tend to interpret the darkness in Jerusalem. Nor it was caused by dark and heavy clouds, which completely covered the sunlight in that area. The point is that the text implies that the darkness of the day fell everywhere, not just in Jerusalem. Phlegon of Tralles, which is a place in modern Turkey nowadays, in the second century wrote a chronicle of Olympiad, Olympic Games, in 16 books. And he writes that during the reign of Tiberius, the emperor Tiberius, 
there was, I'm quoting, the greatest eclipse of the sun and that it became night in the sixth hour of the day, i.e. moon, so that stars even appeared in heavens. There was a great earthquake in Bithynia, he says, and many things were overturned in Isaiah. He says that darkness, which appeared in the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad, was such as not experienced before. Even major Christian writers of the time picked up on Phlegon's description from the first century. Among them, the famous origin of Alexandria in the eastern part of the church. But also in the western part of the Christian church in Rome, Tertullian, who was a church father there in Rome, he records that uh, there was a strange eclipse which Roman officials could not explain around the time. But there were also other historians who happened to mention the strange phenomenon occurring in AD 33. One of them is Talus in about 52 AD. Although his original writings have been lost, he is specially quoted by a famous uh, historian, Julius Africanus, in the uh, third century. And Africanus states, quoting, Talus in the third book of his histories explains away the darkness as an eclipse of the sun. And Talus says, this is unreasonable to me. Africanus himself actually became a Christian and uh, he has a lengthy discussion about the darkness and he argues that the solar eclipse could not have occurred during the lunar cycle of the Passover festival. For Africanus, naturalistic explanations for the darkness at the time of crucifixion don't make any sense. When the gospel writers record the same event, they don't appeal to natural explanation either. They want to create different kind of association or associations in the minds of readers. One of such is an association to creation and the other to Exodus. Let me explain. The darkness that surrounds Jesus on the cross, people in Jerusalem and indeed the whole world may have brought to the minds of definitely pious Jews, the story about the primordial or first darkness in which our world was before it was touched by the creative and life-bringing hand of God. Genesis says the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. Now these words, of course, would be remembered by heart by the readers of the crucifixion story. The narrative of creation in Genesis 1 portrays how God started the act of creation by eliminating the realm of darkness in which the earth was covered. He eliminated darkness by creating light and splitting darkness from it. God saw that the creation of light was good. Consequently, the primordial darkness of the cross, of the chaos, symbolizes evil, and essentially it's, it's seen as evil, as nothingness, a realm outside of God's creative touch. Throughout the narrative of Genesis 1, God is acting to create boundaries between not only light and darkness, but also between waters and dry land, between animate and inanimate life. What was formless and dead through divine ordering becomes alive. The image of Jesus dying on the cross with outstretched hands or arms in darkness brings us all back to the darkness of pre-creation. The sun which God created to rule over the day has been removed. The boundaries which God put in place between light and darkness, water and dry ground, the boundaries which give creation structure, they appear to be gone on the day, gone on the day. As Jesus is dying, the primordial darkness rules. Earth is being shaken and the dead are being raised. The boundaries between life and death are being diminished. 
Darkness indeed is a profound theme in the Bible. And one place which brings, which connects the, the narrative of creation, cross and darkness, is also that of Exodus. Not only the climaxing plague, which leads to the final plague in Exodus, the death involves darkness, but the individual judgments demonstrate that in Egypt, creation is moving backward. In Genesis, everything starts from death and darkness, and through creative ordering of boundaries, moves to more and more developed life. In Egypt, the direction is reversed. Water becomes blood. The first plague shows that the boundaries between animate and inanimate life stopped working. Blood representing life. Water is inanimate. Now they are mixed. Frogs, lies, and flies mixing with people, plague two, three, and four, show that the order between living species is broken down. A disease on livestock and boils on people and animals, plague five and six, shows that boundaries between healthy and sick creation are gone. The plague of hail, number seven, shows that boundaries between fertile ground and unfertile ground, between life-bringing water and deadly water stopped working. Locusts plague eight, which destroyed all crops, show that boundaries between plenty of the earth and hunger are broken down. And finally, darkness, plague nine, destroys the basic boundaries between light and darkness. And everything stops, right? Life stops. The very first boundary which was set in place by God is broken down. It very much appears that the Egyptian plagues are actions of judgment which are purposefully breaking down the process which God began at creation. At creation, God builds boundaries and creates order and structure so that life could exist. In Egypt, God withdraws his creative order. Where, however, there is no order in place, life is not possible. God is destroying boundaries or withdrawing, you may say, boundaries for Egypt, showing the Pharaoh that they are no more part of his creative order. The penultimate plague of darkness, which leads to the final one, death, non-existence, is a direct echo of the first day of creation, where creation begins, or where creation began. Egypt ends there. Stretch out your hand towards heaven, says the text of Exodus, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, darkness which may even be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand towards heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt. Three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. Life stopped. It is interesting that it was this ninth plague, darkness, which leads to the tenth plague, the death. Jesus' experience on the cross with the parallels of darkness, looming death, number three, and generally the context of judgment, all invoke the experience of Israel's exodus from Israel. Egypt. At that time, exodus of God's people was finally possible because a firstborn died, because a Passover lamb died. With images intertwined between the exodus and the cross narratives, we gain a distinct sense that there on the cross, the anti-type of exodus is taking place. Just as Pharaoh and his Egypt endured the judgments because of their iniquity. On the cross, Jesus is enduring the judgments for the iniquity of people. The darkness falls on him as it fell on Egypt. He is dying in the darkness and by his death, guess what? 
the people of God will be liberated. Jesus was indeed dying in the darkness, and that was symbolic of where evil and sin lead, or where they lead is decreation. Isaiah says, And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. When Jesus cried out, My Lord, my Lord, why have you forsaken me? Maybe he really implies that God has withdrawn from him in an act of decreation. And he lets the primordial darkness to fall over the whole earth. A strange darkness covered the unholy scene of Jesus' painful struggle from the eyes of humans. The mocking cries, you can imagine very easily, have probably been silenced. The temperature has fallen. It probably felt like time has stopped, like in Egypt. In the silence, the crowd now can hear far better the heavy breathing of Jesus and the voice and the words which he says. Because of darkness, even the Sabbath preparations were disrupted. And because it was a Passover Sabbath, lamb, lambs had to be carefully prepared according to the law. Guess what happens? The darkness stops all that. And hence, literally and symbolically, shows that God has gotten for himself a replacement Passover lamb. The sacrificial Passover lamb is already in its place. People don't have to get rid of their own lambs. They can't in the darkness. He is, as John the Baptist said, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is your Passover lamb. Today, as we remember Jesus' experience on the cross and its meaning for us, we should celebrate the fundamental truth of this occasion, that occasion, that in Jesus, the darkness is gone, is dispelled. He is the only one who has power to take us out of our own darkness of evil. He's the only one who provides the true exodus from the slavery of sin and evil. None of us, none in the world has to endure the breakdown of creative order and end up in primordial darkness one day, as Egypt did. In Jesus, the exodus has begun and through him it is taking place today as well. And that is what we came to celebrate today. This is what we remember today. The cross of Jesus. Darkness dispelled. And exodus from sin and guilt taking place today. Apostle John was right when he said, In him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it. Amen.